Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best minds in the sport so you can train smarter, stay healthy, and run faster now. And now your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir, and I would like to welcome you to another edition of the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. I have only been a podcaster for just over three months now, and each time I record, I can feel my confidence growing a little. I have already had the opportunity to meet so many wonderful people and I make sure to take my time researching my guests to give them thoughtful questions rather than just the same old questions that they're going to get from most interviewers. I'm not going to lie, when I start podcasting I am nervous. I am well aware that I am talking to someone who has given up the most precious resource to share their knowledge with the Runners Connect community. When I received the confirmation email about the interview with my guest today, I was over the moon. However, that excitement soon turned to panic as I realised just how influential this guest was within our running world. I am pretty sure almost everyone listening has either read or at least heard of the book Born to Run. And when you hear that people like Matthew McConaughey have read the book and they requested to play one of the main characters in the upcoming film, it's hard to not be intimidated. Chris McDougall is a legend within the running world. However, from the moment I began talking to Chris for this interview, I felt at ease. He told me he was excited for the interview questions, and at the end of the interview, he stated he would have been happy to continue recording and talking. Wow, what a confidence boost. I'm sure you're going to enjoy this interview as much as I enjoyed talking to Chris, and you will learn so much in addition to wanting to read his new book, Natural Born Heroes as soon as you possibly can. So who is Chris McDougall? Chris is best known as the author of the 2009 book Born to Run, a hidden tribe, super athletes and the greatest race the world has never seen. It spent 178 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list, was selected as one of Amazon's 100 books to read in a lifetime and was voted the Forbes and Washington Post Book of the Year. Born to Run is currently being made into a feature film. Chris also created the outside magazine series Art of the Hero and has also written for Esquire, the New York Times magazine, Men's Journal and Men's Health. His new book, Natural Born Heroes, How a Daring Band of Misfits Mastered the Lost Secrets of Strength and Endurance, releases this week and is available for purchase on Amazon, which you can access directly from runnersconnect.net forward slash natural born heroes. Some of the topics Chris and I are going to discuss today include how Chris knew Born to Run was going to be a success and what he would do to change it if he could go back. What gave Chris the inspiration to travel to Crete to learn about the unsung heroes of World War II and how they were able to accomplish what should have been impossible tasks? How Chris changed his perception of what a hero is and why we need to move away from the stereotypical Hollywood image of a hero towards the true traits of heroes, strength, skill and most of all, compassion. Why we have become obsessed with competing and performing and what we can do to get back in tune with our bodies. Why most of our problems are linked back to a product to change a behaviour. What we can learn from a baby goat. What role the fascia plays in our human movement and why it has not become more popular in studies. Why you should try to put yourself in a situation where you are forced to confront doubt every single day. And how you can use the Maffetone method to retrain your body to no longer reach out for sugar or go into panic mode to look for fast fuel. And finally, why our sharing social media culture is actually good for us and why we will bring more joy to our lives if we step away from the race culture right now to get back to sharing instead. The links we talk about today, in addition to Chris's new book, can be found at runnersconnect.net forward slash natural born heroes. That's natural born H-E-R-O-E-S. We have lots to cover today, and this is an interview that is sure to get you thinking. So why don't we just do that, and let's go meet Chris. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast, Chris. We're so excited to have you. I am delighted to be here. 
It's great to hear you say that as well. So uh, most people know you because of your first bestseller book, uh, Born to Run, which was arguably one of the greatest running books of all time. So let's talk about that just for a few moments first. Um, so that book follows your discoveries about how the Tara Humara, am I saying that correct? I just want you to say that first thing again. Okay. First of all, the fact that you call it my first bestseller which means that you think this one, next one's going to be a bestseller too. I'm really happy about that. <laughs> uh, the fact that you call it the greatest running book, I'm not sure if you said this exactly, but I hope you said the greatest running book of all time, which I will now walk around on a cloud for the rest of the day. <laughs> I did say arguably, but I do believe that myself. <laughs> that is the best running book I have ever I have uh, read. Something, something was going to deflate that balloon. <laughs> Taro Humara is... Okay, Taro Humara. Okay, good to know. Um, well, they, how they were able to run hundreds of miles across all kinds of terrains at speed without resting, yet most of us become injured after just a few short runs. Um, and, you know, it was a great book, as I've already said, and uh, most people will actually have read it, or if they haven't, you definitely should check it out, and you can read it, uh, find the link on our show notes, which I'll mention in a minute. But did you ever imagine it would take off the way it did when you wrote that book? You know, this is a hard thing to answer without sounding <clears throat> really arrogant. Um, but logically, I kept thinking as I was working on the book, like, why would this not be a really popular book? Because running is hands down the world's most popular recreational sport. Nothing else even comes close. So you have millions and millions of people who run. And yet you look at the running bookshelf, it's really thin. It's out-of-print memoirs or the same old advice books, all the same old how-to books, like how to avoid chafing, how to go to the running shoe store. There's nothing out there which actually, to me, depicts what running is like for most of us, which is a fun adventure. So I thought, if this book doesn't do well, it's only because I screwed it up. <laughs> no, I'm sure that wasn't the case, but that is a good point. I, I guess I'd never thought of it that way. So it is... Uh... There wasn't really too much around, and there are more now, so it, I wonder if you did kind of start that off, that people wanted to read more about it. Um, and it's currently being made into a movie starring Matthew McConaughey, um, yeah. which is pretty exciting. And uh, how does that feel for you, knowing that you know not only did it sell well as a book, but now it's being made into a movie with uh, some very famous uh, celebrities in it? You know, the, the funny thing about that is I think because I live in a really rural area and we don't have any television here, uh, so most of my contact with the outside world is sort of weird and sporadic. All my neighbors are Amish, by the way, so the conversation okay. around here is never, ever about popular culture. Mm -hmm. So it is weird every once in a while when you get this message from the outside world from, like, you know, Matthew McConaughey that he has read the book uh, – that's, that's a really cool thing about it is that it has reached a person that I have zero contact with and somehow independently he read the book and really liked it mm -hmm. and was intrigued by the character of Caballo Blanco. Yeah. Wants to play it. Like, I don't know. Something about that is really exciting. It's, it's even more exciting than the fact that the film was being made, the fact that the book itself has just sort of spider webbed out there in the oh, direction yeah. it's all. Oh, I didn't even realize that he actually requested to play um, – I, I had oh, that's that's crazy. I had no idea it was. Uh, I thought he, you know, they, someone just reached out to him and said, "Will you be in the movie?" I didn't know that he read it and that was what inspired him. That's that's interesting. That's great. Wow. Yeah. Um, and is there anything you would have done differently if you could have gone back and either written the book again or just when it came out, anything you would have changed? I actually think I got really lucky. I think that there were a lot of mistakes that I ordinarily would have made and I luckily didn't make writing this book and I think the primary thing I got lucky about was that at the time I was writing the book I was really kind of uncertain about this whole barefoot thing this whole running shoe thing uh, this is stuff that I was researching it was stuff that I found persuasive but I wasn't myself a barefoot runner and I felt like I was evaluating evidence. So I was like a member of the jury. You know, I wasn't a member of the prosecution. I was just kind of weighing the information here. And so at the time I wrote the book, I was, uh, I think much more unbiased and objective, um, about barefoot running than I became subsequently. Then after now, years later, I'm much more of like a foamy mouth zealot. And I'm glad I wasn't back then. Cause I think it would have actually spoiled the book. Back then, I was kind of like, look, here's what people are saying. Judge for yourself. Back now, I'm like, no, scientific evidence. 
I'm right. Listen to me. So <laughs> that is one big pitfall that I luckily sidestepped. Uh, the only other thing I would change is it's funny. People keep telling me that Chapter 2 is boring. Uh, I didn't think so. I thought it was kind of ingenious, but I think I would have taken popular opinion in, in stride and actually changed Chapter 2. Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I guess in some ways it's good that you do, you know, you are open to listening to people's opinions about uh, specific chapters. I mean, I can't remember specifically what chapter two was, but um, as it has been a few years, but um, that's good. That's good to know. And actually, uh, I, I was going to mention it later, but maybe it's a good time to talk about it now. Um, you actually, in your in your new book, which we're going to go on to talk about in a moment, you uh, one of your chapters, you started with a quote from uh, Dr. Daniel Lieberman, who was actually a guest on our podcast a few weeks ago. And, uh, you know, he mentioned how how he began looking into that area of uh, barefoot running and he explained quite a few things and it was it was really interesting uh talking to him and then seeing it in your book seeing a quote from him and um has he has he played a role in uh what you've kind of researched over the years you know it's funny we have a, a weird history together um dan and i because number one i think if he had taught me when I was in school, I actually probably would have gone to class, you know, <laughs> find him to be unbelievably like yeah. funny and cool and interesting. Uh, he gave a lecture one time, we did an event and I invited him to just come on stage and talk about whatever you want to talk about. He talked about the evolution of underwear. Well, <laughs> spellbound for like 40 minutes about how we started to wear underwear and what role it plays and how it has changed throughout time. So, um, and the other thing about Dan is that at first I found him very hard to access because he's a super busy guy. He travels all the time. He teaches. And our first point of contact was I, I really wanted to spend time in his lab with him because he was doing the groundbreaking research on the running man theory of evolution. And he kept putting me off and putting me off. And finally he said, look, I'm actually running into a problem. If you can solve my problem for me, you can come up and do an interview. And my problem is this. I need to find a one-armed ultra runner who runs with his prosthetic attached, not with the prosthetic unattached, because I got a million of those. <laughs> Some guy who runs with a thing attached. You find me that guy, and you can come on up and watch watch the research. And what he was basically trying to do was figure out what role the uh -huh. swing arms play in balance. Huh. But the best way to do that is to actually remove an arm and like see what the difference is. But it's hard to do that with a you know two-armed person. So luckily, I actually tracked to do Dan. I tracked him down like 20 minutes. I found a guy in San Diego who is an Ironman triathlete, likes to keep his prosthetic on, set up the uh, experiment for Dan. And Dan's all right, come on up, come on up to Cambridge. And then we started hanging out together. We found out that actually one of my closest friends from college, Dan had a major crush on when he was in middle <laughs> school. And so we became sort of linked ever since. A ridiculously long answer to your question, but it comes down to this is, the really cool thing about Dan is that for a guy who is as accomplished and knowledgeable as he is, he still has this very um, childish no, uh, sense of of um, joy and like bewilderment. Like mm -hmm. he's always fascinated by stuff, and he wants to like check it out, and he never assumes that he knows it all. Uh, he, he comes into it sort of like he's not quite sure he wants to find out, and that's never left him. And just having a conversation with him just gets your mind just boiling. Yeah, about. oh, definitely, definitely. I agree that I actually felt noticed the same thing when I was talking to him. So it's good to hear that from someone who knows him even better. Right. Um, so, definitely. yeah, I will uh, put a link to uh, the interview with Dan, which is going to be on our show notes, which you can find at runnersconnect.net forward slash natural born heroes. So speaking of which, let's move on uh, to talk about um, your new book, which is coming out uh, at the time of recording. It hasn't come out yet, but when this is released, it will be coming out this week. So um, your foot was the original reason you began exploring uh, Born to Run. But what was it that inspired you to look for the, these misfits within uh, Natural Born he Heroes? It was pretty similar with uh, Born to Run. I was questioning, and when I heard about the Tarumara, I was wondering, how is it that these guys are like 80 years old, doing 100 and 200 mile runs in these skinny little sandals, and they're not getting hurt? And yet, I am like a fraction of that age, wearing the best running shoes money can buy, and I'm hurt all the time. With Natural Born Heroes, there's something similar. I heard about a guy called the Cretan Runner, 
who was a messenger on the island of Crete for the resistance during World War II. And this guy would routinely do these 50 and 70 mile runs through the Cretan mountains on a starvation diet. And he did this for four years. So my question became something similar, which was, how on earth did these guys actually do it? If you ask me to do multiple stage race ultra marathons day after day after day, living on boiled hay, I'm going to break down. I'm not going to be able to pull it off. So, and again, it wasn't as if it were a couple of like mutant misfits who were doing this. This was a widespread group of people of all different ages and backgrounds and nationalities who were all combining in the resistance. So I thought clearly it's not their physical makeup. It's not their genetics. They must have tapped into something that allows them to pull off what seems like superhuman feats. And I wanted to find out whether these were things that we could learn ourselves. Oh, definitely. And I, I like that in the book, you know, you like you said, you didn't just talk about, uh, you didn't just find out about um, people that were from Crete. There was also, which I obviously am a little uh, um, passionate about, there was British people in there who kind yeah. of learned the ways. And um, so it was good to see that it wasn't just, you know, like you said, some kind of like superhero born with um, all these unique abilities. It was, you know, a, a group of different people. So do you want to just give us a brief overview of what the book is about for those who are thinking about purchasing it? Yes. So I, I decided to focus the book on Crete for a couple of reasons. One was one of the greatest exploits of World War II occurred there. And it, again, it was this beautiful moment of Zen inspiration because there was a band of Greek and British resistance fighters who were up in the mountains. They're surrounded by 80,000 German soldiers on a very small island, which meant that they really didn't have a lot of opportunity to pull off any kind of armed conflict because they'd be destroyed. You engage them in fighting, they will wipe you out. And besides, at this point, it was pretty clear that lots of shooting was only going to create more shooting. Uh, like The fighting was leading nowhere. So they had this idea of like, you know what, let's just do something dramatic, which puts this, this fear into the soldiers around us. We'll, we'll never outshoot them, but what if we like outmaneuver them? So they came up with this plan of making the commanding German general, the most heavily protected person on the island, just disappear, just vanish and get them off the island. So it's a crazy scheme, and it was actually outlined. They, they sort of mapped it out like one morning with a hangover sitting in a bathroom. They actually mapped it out in like the steam on a mirror. That, <laughs> that's the kind of thinking that went into this, this harebrained scheme. But off they went to try and capture the commanding German general and then take him on the run across the island while being pursued. And that's, that's, that's why I wanted to focus on that. What became really intriguing was when you start to drill deeper about – why this would take place on uh, be successful on Crete? It's because of all of these centuries and centuries worth of education about the Greek heroic ideal. You know, the idea of the hero actually was born on the island of Crete. Zeus, according to mythology, was born on the island of Crete. So when you go up against the Cretans, you're not just going up against you know a, a shepherd walking around with a stick over his shoulder. You're going up against a guy who has been born into a culture of heroism which dates back thousands of years oh yeah i i uh, that's a great summary right there because i i was thinking after reading it i i i didn't know there were so many different aspects of it that i didn't i mean obviously the story focuses on what you just mentioned right there but you did bring in all the different aspects of you know how they did it and uh i loved how you kind of bounced around between um what they were doing and your story of how, you know, when you went over there and kind of like saw through it and uh, other little people that were involved over the years and, you know, even things down to parkour, which was really interesting. So thank you for the summary there. So um, in the book, you talked about how we are alike as humans. You also mentioned that a few minutes ago. Um, and you said there was a there's a gender difference of less than 10%. Um, and you mentioned some of the inspirational accomplishments like uh, Diana Nyad, Amelia Boone, Pam Reed. But why do you think right now in our Western culture, there's such a big focus on these differences rather than how we are so similar? If I were a woman right now, I'd be <laughs> really annoyed. You know, <laughs> outraged because the entire world of sport has been created by men for men. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, the fact that, you know, until very, very recent, until the 1980s, I was in college and women were still not allowed to compete in the marathon. And again, it's, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, so what, basically what happened was, I believe uh, that the people who dominated entertainment and sporting culture created uh, performances which highlighted the differences between men and women. So if I personally want to create a sport that I want everyone to do, I will highlight things that I personally am good at and not things that I am, am poor at. So you look at, at the sports which sort of dominate, it's, you know, football, basketball, hockey. These are sports created by men for men to highlight distinctly male attributes, which is upper body strength and explosive power. The only thing about that is, is that those are not our strength as a species. Mm-hmm. Those are strengths for a gender. But you take, you know, a, a man in, in the wild and have him rely on his upper body strength and his explosive power, and he will become food for bears overnight. <laughs> uh, you cannot compete with other creatures. Where we can compete with other creatures, where our species is really strong, has to do with agility and endurance. Those are the things we're really good at. We mm-hmm. can move long distances uh, on our bipedal upright feet and do that extremely well. So I have a feeling I'm giving you a really convoluted answer to what should be a simple question, but uh, it basically comes down to this. I think we've strayed from what we do well as a species, and we've specialized in the stuff that we're not really that good at. And the things that we are good at as a species, that's where you see the differences between men and women are, are diminished. So you look at, you mentioned uh, Pam Reed and Diana Nyad. In long distance endurance events, long distance swimming, long distance running, that's what humans are really good at. And you can tell it because men and women are both good at these events. Parkour, the idea of using your agility <clears throat> and flexibility to move across uh, your terrain. That is a naturally evolved human activity. And when you look at parkour, men and women are almost equally good at it. Oh, yeah, definitely. And do you think um, as, you know, women are starting to, the participation rates are starting to go up within, you know, endurance sports, do you think uh, people will start to change their perceptions on things? Because um, as the as more women become involved, you know, this, this gap is probably going to lessen, um, especially in endurance sports. So hopefully there will be less of a, kind of um, gender distinction between the two? You know, we're going through something right now in the United States where a professional American football player decided to step away from the sport. At at age 24, he stepped away from a multi-million dollar contract because the overwhelming evidence of the concussion rates and the brain damage from this sport finally convinced this guy, like, age 24, I am not going to risk my brain in order to earn money. And he's being lambasted. As a, as a fool, why would you give up that kind of money? He's like, because, you know, I can earn money, but I can't replace my brain. Mm-hmm. So you know, your question is whether the attitudes will change. I don't know. I'm not particularly mm-hmm. optimistic, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that people like to do what they like to do, and getting that shining light of clarity to, to penetrate sometimes is, is – you would think that this guy who is clearly making a moral – ethical and personal choice would be applauded and instead he's being you know lambasted Mm -hmm. i I would like to think that because i think something like 80 percent of new runners right now are women yeah um when you look at parkour which again 10 years ago there were almost no women in parkour at all you look at it now and some of the really exciting performers in parkour are women Mm -hmm. so i like to think that that is going to go viral and spread but I don't know. I'm pessimist by nature, so yeah, it's diff- it's difficult to know. Although, um, as we are kind of in this area, we'll we'll keep going with it. But um, I just want to talk about um, what uh, Erwan Lacour is. Am I, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, how he uh, talked about the health club industry and um, that uh, the health club industry is is the only business that depends on customers not showing up. And you talked about this quite a lot in the book and um, how, you know, the purpose of them is to create bodies that look as, as alike as possible, which, but they're not useful. You know, what does it help you if you can, you know, bench press something, um, but you can't, uh, you know, for me, example, if I, I can't um, do a, a pull up or anything like that, you know. If I was hanging on to something, I'd, I'd be I'd be done for because I couldn't lift my my own body weight up. But I do think there is an image changing kind of thing away from this, like what you call the super male 
um, towards strong and unique bodies, maybe more so in women than in men. But would would you agree with that, that there has been some kind of change? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I am not sure. Um, I think the difficulty is once you become convinced of something yourself, it's easy to find evidence to Mm -hmm. back up or other examples to back it up. And I, I agree with you. My, my first inclination is to say absolutely yes. Uh, when I'm in the UK, I went to a, an all women's parkour class, and I'm surrounded by like 30 like super strong, agile women. So from that perspective, to me, it's like yeah, this is taking off like wildfire. But then you step back a little bit and you realize, you know what? There are millions of more LA fitness clubs mm-hmm. in the world sure. than there are women's only parkour jams. Uh, I think, and I, I also saw something similar sort of a rise and fall with, with the running shoe industry. And that's why I also have a bit of a, <laughs> a in perspective because there was this brief shining moment when people were really intrigued by the idea of running form and stripping away all the bogus marketing nonsense attached to running shoes and really learning about running form. And yet I feel like now five years later, <laughs> I'm watching just like the tsunami of marketing just overwhelm that, that nascent movement. And that's why I like to think that the difficulty with gyms is they are just too much money. They're just too much money attached to let some naked French dude in board sports <laughs> in Brazil, you know, knock them down. Yeah, definitely. And it's it's difficult. And you did talk about this um, in the book um, that not only is it, you know, the health food, uh, health industry, but it's the, the food industry and the drink industry. And we'll go on to talk about that in a little while, which you kind of talked about a lot in the book about uh, Maffetone and Tim Noakes. Um, but for now, I just want to uh, go over just as it was kind of in the earlier part of the book about um, heroism, which is, you know, the a big focus within the book. Um, and I love that you said about um, Greeks believed that true heroism was an art, not an accident, and uh, how heroism was not about strength or boldness, but about compassion. Um and could you just tell us a little more about what you found about true heroes compared to, you know, what we see, uh, you know, maybe on the TV or just within the media about, you know, these people born with super hu- superhuman strengths or whatever. But instead, it's it's not really about that. Yeah, this was a surprise to me, too. <clears throat> um, again, kind of similarly, I hate to keep cycling back to running shoes, but, you know, that was like the first time in my life that I felt like. I did something smart. You know, I I feel like with running shoes, I was really convinced of one thing and I learned something differently. And and to me, that's got a major shift in my own perspective. I I can't think of many times in my life where I had believed something for a very long time and then came to believe the opposite. And that's what happened to me with running shoes. Uh, And the idea of the hero was kind of similar. You know, I assumed that a hero was someone who's willing to sacrifice him or herself and that he was someone, he or she was someone big and powerful that would assert themselves in a moment of crisis. Then I start reading up on the ancient Greeks and I realized they don't have that concept at all. Like Odysseus is one of the, like, the sneakiest, uh, sneakiest bastards around. He's <laughs> sneaky, cunning, lies like hell, Uh, He's the exact opposite of what we would think is the hero. Yet over and over again, he's referred to as the best of the Achaeans. Like he's of all the heroes, Achilles, Hercules, Odysseus is the best. I mean, one of my favorite moments of the uh, Iliad is when Priam is trying to raise the troops and they're going to go and they're going to go to uh, Troy and they're going to take on the Trojans. And, uh, they go to gather all the kings, and they, they go to Ithaca, and they go for Odysseus. And Odysseus sees them coming, and he, like, gets his plow, and he starts plowing rocks, and he starts pretending he's crazy. He's like, acting like he's a lunatic because he's trying to basically get out of the military service. He doesn't want to go. And they, they, they sort of foil that plan. But eventually he goes back. The guy who foiled the plan, he goes back and gets him. But Odysseus, he's, he's a crafty dude. Mm-hmm. And he's an old guy. He's old. He's beat up. He's aching. He's crafty. All the things we think are not heroic, that's who this guy is. So that's when I started to think about this a little bit more and do some more research. You can actually find references to Hercules. Again, we think of Hercules being the biggest guy in the room. Mm-hmm. There are references to Hercules being not particularly big, that he was had an indomitable will, but he wasn't physically overwhelming. 
And that's when I started to really examine what the idea of the hero was. And it really comes back to three things, which not all of them you would necessarily relate to heroism. They have to do with strength, skill, and compassion. Now, compassion in most of our culture is what you associate with, like, old nuns in India, you know, mm-hmm. like sort of frail people who are kindly but not really going to kick much ass. But when you start to look at what compassion really is, you know, compassion from a practical standpoint is about being alert to things in your environment that could end up really screwing you up. You know, if you've got a brother that's getting constant gambling debts, at some point his problem is going to become your problem. You know, if you've got a kid that's driving drunk, at some point that kid's problem is your problem. So what compassion really is, is this social networking that alerts you to the fact that people that you are related to are getting themselves into the kind of problems that could end up uh, upending the ship. And it's only a practical response for you to deal with these people, solve their problems for them. So that's, that's what I started becoming intrigued by was I wonder if we cannot reverse this misguided Hollywood notion of what mm-hmm. a hero is and get it back to the really practical one, which is someone who is skillful, who has developed uh, bodily strength, not necessarily muscular strength, and is also so in tune with people around them that he can actually step in with preventative measures before they become out of control. Oh, yeah. And I, I like that you talked about uh, empathy as well and how that is, you know, another source of strength and that that relates to that compassion as well. Um, and then so related to that, you you talked about how we've stopped relying on our uh, wonderfully adaptable bodies. Um, and do you think this is partly why we have such a hard time listening to our bodies um, when they're trying to tell us something, you know, especially when it comes to running, we've become so reliant on our GPS watches and what things, you know, what we should be doing, what rather than actually listening to what our body is actually telling us. Do you think part of that is true? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. There's so much at work here too. You know, we've created this this competition culture as well. Mm -hmm. Everything's always about races and times and speed and not about skill and development. Every single day I open my my email and every single day I have dozens, if not hundreds of messages from people saying, how long will it take me to adapt? I want to run barefoot. How long (laughs) is it going to take? My calves are sore. When will this stuff come sore? It's like, dude, what is is the fucking hurry? What is the hurry? But it's like, how quickly can I compete? Because I still want to run a marathon in two months. Mm -hmm. It's not about mastering the skill. I mean, imagine if some kid's playing the violin, like, how long until I can play, you know, the, the, a, a sonata? You know, yeah. It's as long as it takes. Yeah. You learn it. So, again, it's a difficulty. The idea of not listening to the body is that people are not interested in what the body has to say. Mm-hmm. What they're interested in is how quickly they can then perform at a level they want to perform at. Um but, you know, that phrase gets thrown around so much. Listen to your body. Well, what exactly does that mean? Mm-hmm. What exactly are you listening to? And when you hear it, how are you supposed to respond? Uh, I think that that phrase has become this sort of idiotic panacea that's chucked out there without any instruction as to what you're supposed to be listening for and how you're supposed to respond. That's interesting. And actually, we, we do use that one quite a lot. And I find myself saying it to other people. But it, it is hard to know. <laughs> know what that means i mean it, it may even change from day to day depending on depending on what you're doing what what point in your life you've been at so yeah you're you're definitely right there um, also, point out one more thing too yeah you know this idea again the idea of listen to the body you know we say that a lot too but yet the message we tend to get is actually not that your body is a solution but something else is a solution like get a massage or mm-hmm. go to a class or change your shoes change your shoes every 300 500 miles um, that most of our problems are usually linked back to a product as opposed to changing a behavior. I came across something recently. Again, I, I feel like I've really applied myself to this idea of changing movement, natural movement, and yet every once in a while I, I find myself um, realizing that I haven't been practicing my own medicine. So you know, not recently I've been having this like groin problem. Like, ah, why is my groin sore when I'm, when I'm running? It's sore. And I finally, you know, like after weeks of being perplexed by this, I just looked down and realized, oh, that's weird. Like my right knee, for some reason, I kept sort of veering it to uh, off to the side. So as I'm running, instead of bringing my knee straight forward, it's kind of veering off to the side and then coming forward again. So I was doing this kind of loop with my leg. 
I thought, well, I wonder if I just stopped doing that. So I just straightened my leg. And the groin pain vanished like immediately. <laughs> but again, I, kept, I was not listening. I wasn't actually trying to change the behavior. I was just assuming that something was wrong and I couldn't fix it. Yeah. And I think we, oft, we often jump to that, actually. And that reminds me of something else that you uh, said within the book, uh, which was all the strength, speed and suppleness you need, you already have. You just need to release it. So that kind of relates to that there, that you, you have everything you need. You just have to actually uh, take it in and do what you can with it. But how can our, our listeners embrace that in their daily lives? Or like you, you said, you know, listening to the body has kind of been overused a little bit. But what can they do instead, from your opinion? <laughs> An answer, but it's, it's springing to mind immediately. I'll, I'll try it out, and I'll give, try to give you a better one. My first answer is you know, we, we have some goats, and uh, this baby goat was born the other day. So I went out to take a picture of it. It was just born. It was lying on the ground. It was still, like, you know, wet and covered with, like, membrane stuff. I took a picture, and then I realized the picture wasn't that good, so I went back to take another picture mm-hmm. an hour later. And by this point, the thing was on its feet and, like, walking around and, like, jumping around. Wow. Like, God, 60 minutes, this is a completely <laughs> different animal and already relying on its natural strength. That to me is what it's all about. Uh, when we talk about all this natural ability we have inside, I, I feel like in a lot of ways we're the same as that baby goat, except no one told that baby goat, like, you better do this or you're going to get hurt or be careful. Or, Put your helmet on and only do this. The, the baby goat isn't <laughs> – I can't believe I am talking about a baby goat. But <laughs> – the baby goat is not being barraged by cautionary tales and uh, told to put limits on things. It just gets up and starts to move. Most of us don't do that. Mm-hmm. When you want to exercise, you go to a gym where everything has been designed to keep you in one place. Do not like go swing around. Go one place, stand on this machine, which has been padded. It probably has a seat belt and has been wiped down <laughs> for you. And then move this thing on a pulley, which will not veer in any direction, and do this over and over again. Yeah. So all the range of motion, all the unpredictability and flexibility has been removed from mm-hmm. your life in every direction. Mm-hmm. Even when you've got to run, most of us are running on these unbelievably smooth paved surfaces. Like There's not a single pebble between <laughs> you and the ground. And so you just run in this very predictable, calm, repetitive motion. Mm-hmm. So that's the thing about it is we've, we've taken all this flexibility and adaptability and we just stripped it out of our lives. So I'll give you an example, hopefully a better answer than that one. Uh, I was really intrigued by throwing. I, I was never a good thrower myself. And one of the things I, I come across was this notion that humans are good throwers. So I contacted this guy who is a knife thrower and he came over to my place and he set up a target. And the first couple of times I, I tried to throw, I was, I was terrible. And then he just shifted my form a little bit. And next thing I know, I'm like sinking these knives into this target. Wow. And what he pointed out to me was like, humans are naturally good throwers. Just most of us never let that ability come out. Mm-hmm. And when you do, suddenly you're, you're amazingly efficient. Huh, interesting. And I, I, could, I could believe that with a lot of things, actually. I think um, a lot of the time, yeah, we are trying to force something that just isn't natural. And uh, that's, a, that's a great time for us now to move on uh, to fascia. Uh, you talk about that quite a lot in the book and its role in the human body for movement and particularly for running. Um, and I found it really interesting um, about what you, or everything in in that chapter about fascia and how it remembers your movements and uh, how posture becomes structure. So could you kind of explain a little bit about your findings about fascia? Now, fascia is fascinating. There's a guy in San Francisco, Dr. Kelly Starrett who is a physical therapist, he, he has a book called Becoming a Supple Leopard. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, I, I'm really jealous because I love that idea, the supple leopard. Uh, it's, it, to me, it's exactly what you're trying to do. But Kelly Starrett has this uh, phrase. He says, practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. And he does a lot with like jump ropes. And when you watch people jump rope, they get into certain habits, and that becomes the way they jump rope. And it's very hard for them to break it. And yet, if you change your form to jump rope, it suddenly becomes very quick, easy, rhythmic. And that's one of the ways he quickly shows people how by changing their form, suddenly there's all this elastic recoil energy and rhythm in your in your body already there, pre-programmed. You just need to get it synced in and then lock your body into a posture where that becomes natural as opposed to naturally mimicking the bad behaviors you've had in the past. So here's what fascia is all about. Um, there's a guy named Tom Myers uh, who was an anatomist, 
And whenever they're doing human cadaver dissections, people were always sort of cutting through this like sort of weird filmy, uh, you know, rubbery stuff, getting through that stuff in order to get down to the muscle and the bone where all the exciting stuff was. But what Myers realized is like, well, that, you know, rubbery stuff, it's like everywhere. You know, you dissect the foot, your shoulder, uh, around the stomach, it's everywhere. So rather than cutting through it, he just turned his scalpel sideways. And essentially what he did was he kind of like skinned a human cadaver to reveal the fascia, the elastic recoil tendon underneath it. And what he found is the entire human body is like covered with this stuff, mm -hmm. number one. And number two, it's very fibrous and, and tough to move. And number three, it was connected in an unexpected pattern. It wasn't like smooth from head to toe in one sheet. It actually was a series of crisscrossing fibers across the body. So your right shoulder is connected to your left hip, which is connected to your right knee. This stuff is crisscrossing all over the place like, like a compound bow. And that's when Tom Myers became uh, aware of the fact that what we think is muscular power probably really isn't. The muscles are like a fuse which actually activate all of this rubbery elastic recoil, much like a golf ball. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not the power of the swing that's doing it. It's all that rubbery stuff inside the golf ball, which really creates the rocketing effect. Huh. Interesting. I, I didn't know that about golf ball either. So <laughs> good to know. And why, so why then do you think with all the, all these advances we have in technology or the science or the research we do, why do you think we're not focusing more of, on this role of fascia? I mean, if this, obviously Tom Myers, it, it wasn't recent, right? It was quite a while ago. So why have we not looked into it more? Do you think? I think, you know, unfortunately it's, it all comes back to money, you know, it's mm. a stuff sell and you to exercise your fascia which again actually the gyms the old day gyms um you know prior to like the 1970s it, it actually wouldn't pin the blame on anybody blame it blame it on arnold schwarzenegger <laughs> <laughs> oh. after, after the movie pumping iron came out you know bodybuilding prior to pumping iron was like this kind of like weird like little modeling fetish it was you know dudes and speedos with oil <laughs> nobody was paying much attention then arnold comes around uh, this massive guy just steroided beyond belief, uh, super charismatic. And overnight, bodybuilding went from this invisible subculture into a mainstream phenomenon. At that time, uh, gym culture changed as well. The old school gyms had medicine balls and Indian clubs and these things called combat rings where you held these two rings. A, a gym was a wide open space, much like a CrossFit gym today. It was a wide open space where you've practice full range of motion but the modern gym right now is designed to get many more people through in as little space as possible so you sit them down at a machine and you move them on to the next machine mm -hmm. i think the reason why uh fascia based natural movement isn't more popular might have to do with the fact that why, the reason why barefoot running isn't more popular is because there's no way to make money off of it you know erwin lacour has created something cool but it's very hard to monetize it because basically you're telling people go out in the backyard and climb a tree it's kind of hard to sell them trees. So how do you make money off of it? It's the things that make money which become promoted and marketed and, and take root. Oh, yeah. And it's the sad thing about our culture right now is, yeah, that money kind of funds everything. The companies, I can't remember how many companies you said it was within the food industry, but um, was it like 20 companies and 80%? Yeah. So, you know, it's all all of the industries right now where the, the big uh companies that have the money are funding everything so it is a shame and uh you brought up some great points just there and uh i found it really interesting that area in particular for me i'm trying to work on my form and i really overstrided a lot and um the i went to the uva speed clinic and they actually said the same thing uh practice makes permanent which i found really interesting that you said that exact same thing and uh, i've really been working on it and i had been getting very frustrated recently because uh it's been taking quite a while but reading what you wrote about the fascia and how it takes a while and you know even if you're doing the right thing when you if your fascia is used to doing a particular movement even if it's the wrong one it's still going to take your body a while to readjust so um, I really found that personally very interesting and I'm sure a lot of other people who are trying to work on things like that will enjoy that section too. Um, so let's change slightly. And uh, you talked about, um, this is all running related, but you talked about uh, most guerrilla bands uh, rely on the same cheap and devilish, devilishly 
effective weapon doubt. Um, and cr if you create enough uncertainty in your enemy, you can paralyze him. Now that immediately made me think about um, racing when there's two people and it's towards the end of a race and, you know, they're kind of competing um, and, y you know, e each of them are just waiting for some flash of doubt from the other one so they can kind of like make their move. And then once one person shows that doubt and begins to fade slightly, they usually fade very quickly because that doubt has crept in. Um, I, I, I'm sure that wasn't where you were going with that, but that's kind of where it, it took me thinking about that. So did you, did you kind of see that in, from a running perspective or did you take it, you know, purely from the gorilla kind of standpoint? No, you brought up a great point because it does loop into someone that I, I really wanted to write about in this book and, and didn't. Um, but I did write about him for a web series I created for Outside Magazine, and that's Percy Serity. So Percy Serity, <clears throat> the you know eccentric, great Australian coach who coached Herb Elliott and many others, um, Percy was a master of conquering doubt. So you know, one of the beauties of, of natural movement is it's always unpredictable. You know, you're climbing a tree. It's never going to feel the same way. It might be slippery one day, dry the next day. You may have trouble reaching a branch. The, the beauty of doing things in a natural world and using natural range of motion is that you're always meeting a different set of variables, creating a little bit of doubt in your mind and conquering it. Parkour is, by definition, is the art of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. You will always come up with something in parkour where you think, oh, no. No way. I can't do it. They call it breaking a jump, like looking at a jump you've never done before, being frozen in place, and finally breaking the jump and doing it. Because then when you do it once, then you do it a million times. It's by, it's by constantly confronting doubt, dealing with doubt. So then doubt becomes something that you habitually deal with every day. So Percy Sarity, when he was training Herb Elliott, all the time, he was trying to put Herb Elliott into situations where Herb thought, oh, no, I'm done. And then fighting through it. And so there's a wonderful clip, I'll send it to you, of an okay. interview with Herb Elliott. And he talks about that too. When he's in a race, he was dying. He thought there's no way. Uh, but when he talks about it retrospectively, he said, but, you know, in my training, I've, I've listened to that voice every day. And I learned that, wow, when that voice comes up, I say, ah, shut up, you know, <laughs> I'm not listening to you. And he went through that doubt. So the, the guerrillas during World War II, the partisans, realized that most of us in our daily lives – Surrender to doubt, or we, mm -hmm. we back off. Uh, we are not confronted with the possibility of overcoming doubt and moving ahead. And so they could take advantage of that. I think it's super cool for us, too, because I think it does circle back to ways to make ourselves better people and athletes, which is do something every day that you're not that comfortable doing, and you get better and better at it. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I think running is a great way of, of doing that because, you know, uh, running, as you talked about in the book, especially in the ultra distance, you know, you're confronting so many of those demons that are constantly saying stop, 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 or, you know, doubting you and making all those little things that um, make you want to stop. You're constantly having to attack them. So I, 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 do, I do like that you brought that up. Um, and uh, another person you talked about in the book was uh, John Pendleberry. Um, who said that we believe whatever we are doing today is normal and uh, not much different to the way we always have. But why do we assume that human achievement is always on an upward slope um, and that learning from the past was make, making us stronger and smarter? But this may actually not necessarily be the case. I found that interesting. And you could, if you could just explain what you said there a little bit more. Yeah, I, I think we have this mentality or this, this short-sightedness that um, if something took place more than 20 years ago, it's like, yeah, that's ancient history. Forget about it. Move on. Uh, it's, and it's that short-sightedness, I think, that causes us to constantly cycle back around and around again. I mean, even look at what's happening now with food and diet. We just mm -hmm. constantly cycle around. Uh, the foods now that we were eating in the 1950s, you know, that's, that, the paleo movement is basically eating the way humans ate, not just – 10,000 years ago, but just like 60 years ago, you know, in the 1950s. Uh, and then I'm sure at some point that will be overwhelmed by something else and we'll start over again. So I, I don't know why we have this cycle of rejecting the past and then rediscovering it and starting all <laughs> over again, like, like sort of Groundhog Day stuff. But it's, it's those few people, I believe, who are respectful of 
ancient knowledge that really really benefit from it. And, and those are the people we look now as being visionaries and groundbreaking. Often is not what they're tapping into is a legacy of information. And that, was, that became one of my sort of testing points for the things I was writing about was I wasn't particularly interested in some new innovation. I was interested in some kind of innovation that actually had long, deep roots that you could find it turning up again and again and again throughout history. Like like diet, for instance. Mm-hmm. If you find it being represented not just hot new today, but also prevalent in the 70s and then the 1800s and you know, the year 1000, then you realize that there's some kind of inherited wisdom that should be looked at more carefully. Mm-hmm. And you brought that up a lot. We can actually talk about that now and uh, how you did the, could you tell us about, um, you did the two week test from uh, Phil Maffetone, which was about removing yourself from the this sugar cycle by eating, you know, meat, fish, eggs, avocado, vegetables, nuts and whole dairy. And then also slowing down your running so you stay within the fat burning zone. Um, but could you explain your experience during that two week test that he had you do? Yeah, you know, Phil Maffetone is one of these weird stories that it's sort of baffling how we, like, let him disappear. But, you know, Phil Maffetone, I'm trying to remember even when I first heard about Phil Maffetone, I'd read on some running message board about people who were doing the Maffetone method. Like, if you go on, like, letsrun.com mm-hmm. on the message board, if you look at Maffetone method, you'll find something like, like 20,000 postings of it. And yet, no one has ever really paid any attention to the guy who knows who he is. Um Tim Noakes, you know, the great sports scientist, the editor of, of the – sorry, the author of Lore of Running, you know, he refers reverentially to Phil Maffetone. Yet where the hell is Phil Maffetone? Nobody knows. So <laughs> um, I became intrigued by the Maffetone method. And what it was all about is, you know, Phil was the, the trainer for some of the greatest Ironman triathletes of all time back in the 80s and 90s. And his method – came down to sort of a simple question, which is that, you know, we, we could not have always relied on sugars. There's a very limited amount of sugar you can hold in your body, and yet we have a ton of fat. So his theory was, throughout most of our existence, before we were refining sugars and starches, we must have been relying on fat as fuel. So his question was, how can we do that? How, how, how do we lose that skill, and how can we regain it? So he developed a method, you know, the Maffetone method, for using not using sugars, a constant cycle like goo, gel, goo, gel, but just tapping into your own stored body fat, of which you have enough right now. You could you know, leave today and travel to like Russia by foot without a bite of food just mm-hmm. on the stored body fat mm-hmm. you have. And you see it all the time in these you know, heroic feats of endurance. So Phil said basically it comes down to two things. Um, it's not just changing the foods, but changing the way your body reacts to foods. And the first way to do it, and this is one of the things I love so much about Phil's approach. He's a very gentle, kind of hippie-ish old dude. And as like a product of the 70s, he's convinced that you can only teach by personal experience. You can mm-hmm. never talk people into doing anything. So he created the two-week test. He doesn't create a diet. There's no guidelines. There's no rules. It's just a two-week test. Do this for two weeks and then do whatever the hell you want after that. So the two-week test – says, just remove all sugars and starches from your diet. Just eat low glycemic foods, which are eggs, uh, meats, uh, certain kinds of nuts, uh, whole dairies. At the end of two weeks, you will have retrained your body to no longer reach out for sugar at the first opportunity. He goes, at the end of two weeks, just say, how how do you feel? Do you feel pretty good or not so good? And then... uh, slowly reintroduce certain starches to your diet. So eat a piece of bread and then ask yourself, how do I feel? Do I feel better or worse than I did before I ate that piece of bread? The beautiful thing about the two-week test is that it just brings you back to basics. You go back to first principles and then you cut out all the variables and then reintroduce them. There's a second element though of fat as fuel, which is then also teaching your body how not to go into panic mode where it starts to look for fast fuel. And you basically do that by using a heart rate monitor and keeping your heart rate at a nice um, below ground aerobic threshold so your body is not going into an emergency mode. And those two things combined, it is astonishing the difference you'll, you'll feel. So you really did see, have you kind of embraced that since? Have you stuck with it or how has your diet changed since you did that? 
Yeah, well, again, the beautiful thing about it is uh, Phil hates the word diet, you know, because diet. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Bad choice of word. <laughs> and, um, but what I found is I feel like the lesson has been learned, ingrained. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm constantly like, I was on a long flight, I was starving, so I bought a sandwich. I got on the plane, like, ugh, I, I really regret that I ate that sandwich. You feel the difference immediately. In the past, I would have known. I would have thought, oh, my stomach feels bloated. I don't know why. Now I know exactly why, mm-hmm. exactly what I ate. And as far as the training, the heart rate monitor training is concerned, yeah, absolutely. I feel that when I start to push myself uh, beyond an acceptable level, I'll, I'll pay the price for it. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but when I feel sore and beat up, uh, now I know why. Huh? Interesting. Uh, that no, that's really interesting. And and I did uh, I did like you just mentioned. I like that um, it was the two weeks. You know, you really approach it, really attack it, do it for two weeks, and then you start to bring things back in. So you really can see what things you know bother you, what things make you feel good, and what things make you feel bad. So I think that's that's a realistic amount of time for someone to actually be able to do it rather than saying, you know, six months or, you know, like you said, on, on a diet, it kind of, everyone knows at some point that diet is going to end, but it's hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel because if you are on a traditional diet, then, you know, you don't intend to ever get off that if you, if you are trying to lose weight. Um, Something else too, earlier we talked about listening to your body. Mm-hmm. That's what Phil Moffatone's all about. He's like, how, how can you listen to your body when you're yeah. eating so many different things through the course of a day? His point is, let's just minimize the number of things we actually have to listen to and yeah. then watch and know what they mean. And yeah. same with the heart rate monitor training. It gives you an opportunity to listen to your body mm-hmm. because when you are running as hard as you can, there's lactic acid building up, you're breathing heavily, lots of things are going on. But if you're running easily and something starts to feel off, well, you know what the thing is. You've, you've minimized the number of factors that it could possibly be. Yeah, definitely. That's a good way of looking at it. And uh, I, we do, we have actually interviewed uh, both Phil Maffetone and Tim Noakes on our uh, podcast in the past. So I will put links to those in the show notes, which again is at runnersconnect.net forward slash natural born heroes. So just uh, a quick minute on uh, Tim Noakes. Um, and you, you know, you talked about, uh, and we actually... When we interviewed him, he talked about uh, the dehydration thing and how he, you know, initially was encouraging people to drink more water. And then he kind of realized uh, most of us were kind of like uh, drowning in water because we were having too much. And you talked about um, how we can run other animals to, or in the past had run other animals to death because we're so resistant to dehydration. And then there was not a single report in medical literature of someone uh dying in a marathon because of dehydration but um how does that explain the runners that do collapse from well maybe it isn't but from dehydration during races well a couple a couple things one is are they actually collapsing from dehydration or is Mm -hmm. it just overheating uh the 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 modern well there's a lot of things about that one thing i love about Mm -hmm. noakes is there was a big advertising campaign uh, not too long ago and it was repeated in a lot of running magazines, like, you know, don't trust thirst. You know, thirst is not reliable. Yeah. Nooks is like, when did thirst become not reliable? Like, the <laughs> whole reason you are thirsty is to tell you that you want something to drink. If you're not thirsty, you don't need anything to drink. But, you know, w- since when did, like, Gatorade become smarter than two million years of human adaptation? Mm-hmm. As, that's what I loved about Moffatone, or sorry, of, of Tim Nooks, is that – cycling back to first principles. Like, of course, thirst is good. Why would you tell people not to trust their thirst? But the second thing he looked at, again, looking at races, were a couple different things. And one of the difficulties of races, unfortunately, is it is an extraordinarily unnatural method of human performance. You know, humans, there is no opportunity in the wild where a human will go out on a hot day and run as absolutely as hard as they could for four hours. You would never do that. If you're trying to run another antelope to, you know, animal to death, you do not run like that animal. You run smarter than that animal. That animal is running as hard as he can, which is why he collapses. Mm-hmm. You are supposed to be surging and recovering. So unfortunately, we've created this race model, which is not related to anything in normal human experience. And that's where people get in trouble. They are pushing themselves at the absolute red zone limit of what a human, uh, a human animal can endure. Mm-hmm. When most of the time you want to never ever put yourself into a point of collapse, yet we do it all the time. <laughs> uh, Nose's point was when people are collapsing, it is not because there's not enough water in their body 
ordinarily it's just because they're overheating. They are just put themselves into distress. Um, but he said he never found a case. And he goes, the danger is when people do collapse, the assumption is, oh, they're dehydrated. So they start pumping them full of fluids. They already have plenty of fluids. The problem is actually something else. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good way of thinking about things, actually. And I guess I, I hadn't thought of it that way either. Um, and then, uh, so talking about, uh, you know, how we've learned things from in the past, um, you talked about the three occupations that have uh, always been what we desire the most, being hunting, gathering, and sharing. Um, but do you think our sharing, I mean, I, when you say sharing, to me right now in our current culture, I think of, you know, social media and sharing our, you know, every every move with uh, the world by uh, putting it out there. But do you think it's kind of gone out of control or do you think this is just part of a natural cycle? Oh, I think it's awesome. I mean, uh, I, I think it's amazing. The fact that we're doing this right now, what you and I are doing yeah. was not possible a little while ago. You yeah. and I are sharing ideas. But now it is crazy the amount of things I search for every day and how to do, like the information I get from the internet. Uh, I, I think, no, we are not golden era, era of sharing. I think it's a wonderful thing. And you do tend to see it, I believe, in it seems to be the new mindset in technology startups, uh, the sense that work is not from the top down, that we are a bunch of brains of equal importance and that we will benefit by sharing a lot of things like you know, our, our information. Mm -hmm. So no, I think in, in some ways we are actually sort of cycling back to what was probably the norm tens of thousands of years ago. Like, for instance, you know, if you knew where the best acorns were, you didn't keep it to yourself because you'd be fat on acorns and everyone else in the family would die. The, 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 the culture thrived together, not mm -hmm. laterally. Okay. Yeah, definitely. And actually that, that works in perfectly towards um, what I was going to bring in kind of like a conclusion. Um, at the end of your book, it will kind of click together for you um, about what you and uh, Chris White, who you talk about in the book quite a lot, what you've been looking for. Um, and you talked about comparison, how the whole time you were kind of out there in Crete, you were look you were trying to win, um, trying to like be, you know, be the best and rather than trying to learn whereas Chris had uh you know created his own hero essentially and absorbed it um but why do you think uh that is that we've now come to this stage where um we are constantly looking for comparison looking for things to um be better than others when we should just be sharing our knowledge and you know helping one another to be the best we can be yeah, it's really unfortunate we've gotten to this whole accumulation competition mentality. Uh, it seems to be something like late in life, a lot of us sort of step back and realize, you know what, all this striving, 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 competing, it isn't really getting us anywhere. Mm -hmm. You hear a lot of times in running as well, where when people step away from the race culture and just start to do fun runs and trail runs and have a good time, like suddenly they realize, oh my God, my, my running is so much more satisfying than it was back then when I was constantly trying to shave two seconds off of a PR. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know why it started. Uh, I, I don't know if it was sort of the rise of capitalism or what, but you know, the sense that you need to get and not share has really spoiled a lot of things for a lot of people. And it's when people start to just sort of give back a little bit and relax and enjoy the moment as opposed to trying to benefit from it, that all that, that kind of enjoyment and, and joy starts to flood in. Oh yeah, and I, I, I say I feel like you were talking directly to my heart just there. I've I've only been recently in the past few weeks. I say learning it, but I'll probably have to learn it over and over again. But learning how to enjoy my running and not force it. Thinking, you know, I spent such a long time thinking, well, when's my chance? When's my turn? When's it my turn to run well? But it was only when I started to step back and think about actually enjoying it for the motion that it is and you know just enjoying the journey rather than looking for the outcome that I actually did start to enjoy it rather than feeling it was a chore so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up as a good ending there, there's a, a weekly trail run that I try to go to as often as I can out where I live and it's always on like crappy crazy trails often in the dark mm -hmm. they will run in any weather mm -hmm. there's no way you are going to perform well because you're like running through snow or mud or you, you're losing the trail and yet those runs are the most fun. Uh, and afterwards, everyone sits around, like tailgates and drinks and eats. There's no way you're beating anybody else. You're lucky if you get out of the woods without blood on your legs. <laughs> and for me, like that's the thing I want to do over and over again. Yeah. And you have no idea what the time or the distance is. It was just you, you played in the woods for an hour. Yeah. And it, it's good you mentioned the word play right there because, you know, it is – 
kind of we almost need to get back to being a child where you do play where running is the sense of playing a another form of playing and running across the room rather than you know the oh I have to go run until my Garmin beeps 9.00 so (laughs) that's that's a great way to uh, bring it all together so um, I am going to put a link to the book and um, I hope everyone has enjoyed um, learning from you I know I have but just to finish if you you um, could give me one word to describe what you would like to become, accomplish, achieve this year, what would it be? Compassion. I, I think that is <laughs> of the three things I try to learn. Strength and skill was fun. Compassion is a very hard one to do on a daily basis. Okay. Yeah, so that's, that's a great one. And uh, that came to you very easily, so it must be very like close to the heart. So. I like that. And uh, well, thank you so much, Chris, for your time. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure uh, our listeners will have learned a lot today. And uh, you can purchase Natural Born Heroes. So make sure you do that and give it a read. I would definitely recommend it. Um, So thank you for your time. I I loved it. I would do this every day. This is really fun. I hope that's for our event in London. Uh, I think it's in May 14th or so. Okay. Uh, Well, I'm actually in America. (laughs) Yeah, I live in uh, I live in uh, Kentucky. So, okay. I was afraid you say like Lancaster. I thought, oh man, you're like an hour away. Even oh no, I- unfortunately not. I'm in America, but um, yeah, I appreciate your time. Sure, it was really fun. Thank you. What an interview! We covered so much, and that's just scratching the surface of what his book is about. Make sure you go purchase it if you have not already. While we were talking, if you enjoyed today's podcast, it would really mean a lot to me if you could leave a review on iTunes, on the show notes at runnersconnect.net forward slash natural born heroes there is a video demonstration of just how to do that it would really help us rise up the rankings in itunes to reach our goal of being the number one running podcast it only takes a few minutes i promise thank you so much in advance chris and i have talked about having another interview in a few months to dive into those topics even more so make sure you stay tuned but for now go put yourself in a situation where you confront doubt Have a great week.